dystonia is a condition where different muscles in the body contract for long periods of time in a very uncoordinated fashion. To do normal activities such as to bend your arm or straighten your elbow, you need to have one muscle relaxing and the other one contracting. In dystonia, the muscles don't work in a very integrated, coordinated fashion. And what happens is these muscles almost go into a spasm and leave the patient with very twisted, painful postures. Dystonia can come on very early in life and it can come on later. It can affect the whole of the body, known as generalised dystonia, or it can affect certain parts of the body, such as the neck in cervical dystonia, or just the hand, such as with writer's cramp. Dystonia is often treated with medications, and there are a number of medications that can be utilised by neurologists to try to reduce the severity of the dystonic movements. In some cases, these medications can be effective, but in a lot of cases, patients need to go on to have Botox injections. Botox injections allow the neurologist to reduce the amount of contraction in a particular muscle and can often be very effective in reducing the pain associated with dystonia. Many patients with dystonia aren't able to be treated successfully with non-surgical means. It's now well established that deep brain stimulation is the best surgical treatment for dystonia in these types of patients. Deep brain stimulation for dystonia is generally offered to patients with either generalised dystonia or cervical dystonia. Occasionally patients with writer's cramp may be offered surgery as well. Dystonic patients who are being considered for surgery must have exhausted all non-surgical options first. In many cases, genetic testing is also done. Certain types of gene abnormalities, such as DYT1, suggest a much better prognosis following surgery. Patients who are being considered for deep brain stimulation need to be reviewed by a number of specialists before a final decision can be made as to whether or not surgery is appropriate. These specialists include a neurologist who ensures that the correct diagnosis has been made and that all non-surgical treatment options have been exhausted. Patients are also seen by a psychologist and neuropsychologist. The aim of these evaluations is to ensure that the patients don't have significant depression or anxiety that need to be treated before and after surgery in order to ensure that they get the best outcome. The aim of the preoperative workup is to make sure that we're selecting the appropriate patients for surgery and to make sure that we carry that surgery out in the safest possible way. The preoperative workup also involves an MRI scan and some blood tests. The aim of the MRI is to make sure that there aren't any significant structural problems which would prevent us from targeting a particular structure. The aim of the blood test is to make sure that there aren't any significant blood clotting problems or any other issues that might make surgery too dangerous. The target that we stimulate in dystonia is usually the globus pallidus internus. This structure is thought to be important in the generation of the dystonic movements and by stimulating in that area we can often reduce the severity of those movements. Target selection in dystonia is very important. We know that the globus pallidus internus is the best structure to stimulate in order to give patients the greatest outcome. The globus pallidus internus is divided up into several different areas and it's the motor area or the part of the globus pallidus that is responsible for controlling movements that we need to stimulate in these patients. Target selection in dystonia involves using image guidance software which is like a GPS system for the brain. We choose the part of the globus pallidus internus that we know is going to give us the best result. The area within the globus pallidus internus that we aim for is very, very close to the internal capsule. If we're too close to the internal capsule, that may cause problems in terms of pins and needles down one side of the body, or the patient may even have difficulty moving that side of the body. So we try to find the best possible balance between getting close enough to the correct area but not too close to the internal capsule.
Deep brain stimulation for dystonia is somewhat different to deep brain stimulation for other conditions such as tremor. With deep brain stimulation for tremor, the tremor usually stops fairly instantly. Dystonia responds differently for reasons that we don't understand. Generally speaking, the benefit that a patient obtains from dystonia comes on fairly slowly and builds up over a number of weeks or months. Patients with dystonia shouldn't expect an instant benefit. The benefit that they get will usually come on slowly and it'll usually build up in a gradual fashion over six or nine months. So they do need to be patient. It's very uncommon for deep brain stimulation to completely rid a patient of all dystonic movements. Nevertheless, the majority of patients do obtain a significant benefit. Patients who undergo deep brain stimulation for dystonia often wake up the next day with a lot less pain in their neck or in the other muscles of their body that's affected by the dystonia. However, the improvement in dystonic movements often takes a lot longer and this builds up gradually over a number of weeks or months. So individuals with dystonia need to be somewhat patient after undergoing deep brain stimulation because they're not going to get that same instant response in terms of their movement disorder as say someone with Parkinson's disease might. But they can be hardened by the fact that most patients do obtain.